We just passed 2 million subscribers for the VinWiki channel. After 7 years of making automotive content here on YouTube, I can't thank you enough for all the support, all the views, and for subscribing. Thank you as well to all the storytellers and the sponsors that have made the journey of VinWiki possible. But today to celebrate, I decided to do an AMA. I did these for various milestones along the way, but it had been a couple of years, and so I put out on Instagram and YouTube and places like that, what would you like to know? And you guys submitted hundreds and hundreds of questions and so I cannot answer them all, but a lot of them were repeated and so I've compiled some of them and I am going to answer them today. Now I've kind of divided them into car questions, personal questions, and business questions. And I'll begin with the car questions. Certainly one of the most asked is, what is the latest with the El Chapo McLaren F1? About 10 days ago, I got a brand new lead on the car from the person who's been at least the most communicative of all the people that have contacted me over the years, claiming to know where the car is. And so I'm gonna flesh it all out and I should have some more information for a video in the next couple of weeks on that one. The next, of course, is what is happening with Car Trek. And I really, really appreciate how much you have enjoyed Car Trek. I've enjoyed making it even more than that. Freddie Tyler and I constantly kick around different ideas and I believe we'll put something together this year. They've been very busy, I have as well. And so it's gonna be fun to see what we can do. Ben Collins, the Stig, wants to do something as well. So I don't know, we're gonna find something to do and do more Car Trek in the future. Now, the most common question of all the automotive questions at least was, what is my favorite muscle car? There were a variety of different ways of asking. And you know, I'll be honest, if it weren't for a good friend of mine whose dad was into muscle cars, I never would have developed my love for the automobile. And so I, I've never been a huge muscle car guy myself. I've always kind of sought the extraordinary exotic cars and things like that. But there are some muscle cars that I do really, really love. I mean, the wing cars, obviously Hoovy's Superbird, talked about a lot here by Steve Leto, are really, really cool. I love a C2 Corvette. I think that's the most beautiful Corvette they ever did. Certainly, like most people that loved Gone in 60 Seconds, or at least the Nicolas Cage version, I love an Eleanor Mustang. But I, I don't know, it's not that maybe a little bit too cliche. So there's a lot of muscle cars that I really like, especially a big block Chevelle. We have talked about a muscle car car trek and based on the responses here, perhaps that is the best path forward. The next was, there were a couple people that asked kind of what is the perfect car? And I made a video when I bought my S65 talking about how I think it is one of the best cars ever made, sort of a perfect car. Because I think it all depends on the context. Like in terms of a car to really use, the biggest, baddest AMG Mercedes is always a good option. In the same way, a rear-wheel drive, simple, manual Porsche 911 is always a great option. I love the mid-engine Ferrari V8s, even with or without a manual transmission, and obviously a naturally aspirated 12-cylinder manual Lamborghini. I think all of those cars are perfect. Now, there's always new cars being made, but with the technology that all the new cars have, especially my new electric Audi, I don't find myself loving them more or thinking that they are more perfect. So there's a lot of perfect cars, but really all that matters is what you think your perfect car is, and then you can go and try to buy it. The next question was, what is my favorite car under $10,000? Now, my favorite cars that I've ever bought for under $10,000 would be Tina, the patinaed 996 from Car Trek 6, and my E46 M3 that I bought for our Dream Car Exchange car flipping contest. Now, both of those cars are really worth a bit more than that. I'd also love to say a Honda S2000, but I looked around it and they seem to have evaporated in that price point. I love a lot of these cheaper cars, and I love the fun that you can have in a cheaper manual sports car. So that's also a very interesting car trick premise. I guess we'll have to see. Next question that was asked many times is, am I still looking for a Bugatti? After I bought my first manual LP640, I honestly struggled for motivation. I mean, the next step was really to get a manual LP640 with a title in hand rather than a big loan against it. And when I did that, I really was at kind of a difficult crossroads in my career because most of the best work that I have done has been to try to buy a different car. And I there's certainly other cars that I wanted to buy, but most of them were less valuable than a manual LP640. And so I kind of set the arbitrary goal of going out and buying a Bugatti Veyron. And I do still love the cars. I work at least 10 Veyron deals a year. 
I've got offers out on them all the time. I don't know that I'm necessarily all that much closer, but it does still feel like an itch that needs to be scratched and something that has to happen. In the fairly near future, I've come really, really close many times, and I guess probably for the last year to two years, I've probably been in a position where, with some good financing, I would be able to buy one. But I really think I've got to get rid of a few cars in order to get one, and I haven't really felt like that made sense. I love my Mercies. No, I don't need three of them, and a Diablo, and a Spiker, and all this stuff. But all my cars, I like for what they are, what they represent in terms of assets and investment. We'll talk a little more about that down the question list. But I will, I think, at some point have a Bugatti. I don't know when, I don't know how, but it just feels like it's got to happen at some point. Now, lots of you asked about my thoughts on the Japanese market. Certainly those from the 90s and the 2000s are rising really, really fast, and I think that is well-deserved, and I think that represents what we almost always see of interesting cars between 10 and 25 years of age. Now, when they start to turn 25, we see another jump because that's when the cars that we didn't get in the U.S. are eligible for convenient import. And so I... I'm not personally drawn to these cars. I enjoyed playing with them in Gran Turismo and things like that. But honestly, I was playing with roof cars and European cars more so in those games. I love seeing the market go up and I love the passion that most of the owners groups have for these cars. I spoke at the NS Expo this year and I gotta say, NS Expo owners of the, all the groups of all the car clubs in all the world that I've dealt with are the best, the most passionate. They all love driving their cars. They brag about how many miles they have. They're my kind of car people. I don't fit really well in a lot of those cars and I don't. they don't speak to me the way Italian cars, British cars, and things like that do, but I have nothing bad to say about the market or the future of the market for the JDM cars. The next question was, what car do I most regret selling? And I gotta say, there's two of them that really stand out. The first is a Euro Import 2000 Ferrari 360 Spider with a gated manual transmission that I had for the supercar rentals fleet. Now, by the time we were done putting a ton of miles on it, I gotta say, it was a rat. I mean, rock chips like crazy, the interior worn out, seats torn, just dirty as, as it could be. But it made for some great rental content, some great rental revenue, and I just loved driving the car. Now, it was a terrible, terrible example of a 360, but I loved it. I tried to buy it back, I guess it was about four or five years ago, when I had the 993 that we ended up giving away at a million subscribers, and I, I didn't get a deal put together. It was just a little bit too much at the time. I think it's got 70, 80,000 miles on it now, and I, I would certainly buy it back in the right circumstance. The other one is the Paris Hilton SLR. I've never had an exotic car that the world was so fond of that everybody that walked in the garage wanted to see and sit in, and look, I get it. It was a very, very cool car. I don't know that I wanted to live with the maintenance of the car long term, and I love that it turned into the LP670 SV, which then turned into another manual LP640 in Monterey Blue. And so I don't miss it in that regard, but I did at one point try to trade the Diablo back for it. So I don't know, maybe one day I'll have another SLR. You gotta get the right one. They all drive wildly different, but I do miss that one. What is my opinion of the Gallardo Superleggera? I love them, both the 08 cars and the LP570s. I think they represent a tremendous bargain in the world of sports cars. I think if you were looking for the best first sports car, supercar that you could buy, you couldn't do any better. I love a Superleggera. All of the carbon tweaks that make them special, the performance, the feel of the car, I think it is wonderful. What do I think of all these manual swapped cars from EAG, especially as they start talking about swapping Mercellegos? I love the guys at EAG. Art has been a great helper and a great friend to me over the years. I hate the drama that there's always been kind of surrounding the company. They'll be on here at some point to tell all the stories. But, you know, as people start to swap these cars, I think it makes all the sense in the world. The manual versions are wonderful and they are worth building if you can't buy one. And so I am all for it. It really doesn't negatively impact the market for the real stuff. That's never been the case when it came to engine swaps, transmission swaps, all the things that we've seen throughout the history of the automobile. And so I don't worry about the value of my cars. I get more excited that other people are going to be able to experience something very much like it. Now, the thing is with Mercy's in particular, the swaps are really, really hard and no one has really pulled it off and put a bunch of miles on anything yet. And so I am excited to see how they're going to do that because there are some parts that are really, really hard to get, hard to make, hard to fake, all the things. And so I'm sure someone will figure it out at some point and I can't wait to see how they drive. 
The next question was, what car do I think makes absolutely no sense from a collectability standpoint? And that one was pretty easy. It's PDK GT3s and GT3 RSs. Like, I get that they are the latest, greatest, coolest, fastest, best track car that you could buy, but they'll always be that. They'll be that of their moment. Now, the manual GT3s, I think, do make sense because the transmissions are what end up dating these cars, as well as all the screens and all the technology. And while it's really cool to have one that has all the newfangled everything, eventually we do wish that they were just a little bit easier to live with and maintain and didn't represent so much of a technological difference from what's new. Certainly the gap between an automated manual and a manual transmission is fairly vast, but to me, I think that's what's really going to date these cars. Like a 2016 GT3 RS is an amazing car today, even eight years old. But I think when the car is 20 years old, some of that love's going to be lost. The next question was, what company's flagship cars make no sense? And I have to say, when you look at a Speedtail, an Elva, and a Sabre, these are cars that McLaren thought were going to be just phenomenal successes, but they all sort of flopped and they haven't had much value in the secondary market either. I don't really get them. I love that McLaren is doing such a great job of catering to their highest echelon of clients. And I think these cars represent, you know, exactly what a few people wanted, but certainly there weren't as many people out there that wanted these cars and you don't see anybody really driving, loving and putting miles on them, which I think is the biggest kind of negative or downside that you could apply to the perception of a car. One of you asked, what are my thoughts on vectors? I love vectors. I love the story of vector. I love the look, the feel, the craziness of a vector. I don't really fit in them, so I've never thought terribly hard about trying to buy one. But I do love that there are so few that there's an opportunity for anybody to come in the same way I did for a very similar number of manual US LP 640s and make sure that the stories of all of them are well documented, well told, and cause the perception of them to increase, thereby the values to increase. I don't really think they drive much better than a Lamborghini of the same era, whether it's a Countach or a Diablo, but I do think they're awesome. And I think it's one of those cars that forever you'll be able to pull up to any car show, any event, any drive, any rally, and just shut the place down. The next one was, what was my first supercar? I've talked about that a lot. When I was 20 years old, I got a gigantic loan with a stated income accepting bank for a 2004 Lamborghini Gallardo that later John Tamarian would blow the engine up on. And uh, have I ever tried motorcycles? Only dirt bikes. I know that if I ever got on road bikes, I'd get into a lot of trouble or even dead. I've learned from guys like Nick and his face to know that I should probably stay a little ways away. I do think with the kids growing up, more dirt bikes are probably in the future though. The next question is, if manual LP640s didn't exist, what would I have three of? Now, there's a lot of cars that I really love, but if I was honestly going to collect multiple variants, I could totally see myself having a bunch of Ferrari 360s. Again, just based on how old I was, when it was the coolest car ever made, I just love them. I also love 550s for kind of the same reason. They were the coolest thing at that time. And so I think I, I believe a lot in the future values and the collectability of both of those and very much in how much I enjoy driving them. <laughs> the next one was in 35 years, what will Grandpa Ed be driving? <laughs> I, I fear that I'm far closer to grandchildren than 35 years away. His guess was an S-Class, and that is a wonderful guess because that is probably true. I love an S-Class. I very deliberately don't have cars like that right now because it would keep me from putting cars on my Mercedes and my Spiker and things like that. But I also hope that as an old man, I am still driving around Mercy's the same way if you saw a guy pull up to a coffee shop in a Ferrari 250 or 275 or a 300 SL Gullwing or something like that. I think these cars will be what those are at some point. I don't know if it's in 10, 20, 30, 40 years, but at that point, I hope that I am still squeezing myself into them and putting them up and driving them every place that I possibly can. Now, the next question is, why did Marcelingos climb so drastically in value while Gallardos didn't? Well, the easy answer is there's more than three times as many Gallardos, and that means that the, there's so many of them that are in bad shape, that do transact rather inexpensively, and that it's a lot harder to document exactly what's out there. Again, the factory never did a very good job of it, and so I had to do most of it with Mercy's. No one's done all of that with Gallardo's. I believe someone will. I think manual transmission LP generation Gallardo's represent a tremendous market potential, and they are wonderful, wonderful cars to drive. That being said, 
E-Gear Gallardos are also really, really great cars to drive, and it's not necessarily a car where a paddle shift version would remotely keep me from owning, driving, and enjoying the cars. And I think there's a bigger gap in E-Gear Mercy versus Manual Mercy driving experience than there is with a Gallardo. And I think that's one of the reasons why we don't see the massive value delta, along with not quite the rarity and exclusivity in the Gallardos that we do see in Mercy's. But I still love Gallardos. I mean, the fact that there's really now surviving more Aventadors than there are Gallardos means there is a lot of potential there. But also, when you think about Gallardos going up in value, you're talking about the next step being wide open. As you start thinking about, as I do, trading up from a big Marcielago, there's not that much out there that you like a whole lot more. People that have Gallardos, if their car doubles in value, they're just going to go try something else because in that two, three, four hundred thousand dollars range, there's so much great stuff. There were several versions of a question as to, do I think the Cannonball Run record is still beatable? One said, could it be done in under 24 hours? Now, ultimately, yes. Anything can be beaten. Anything is possible. When you start trying to think about beating 25 hours that was set while the whole world was shut down, certainly that's daunting. Now, we don't have a great, elegant way of having a demarcation between COVID runs and non-COVID runs because there's no governing body on this, and I'm not about to be it. Now, I don't think it was the same game, but it was the same roads and the same kind of cars and the things like that. And so I'm not here to take anything away from those runs. Has it kept anybody from really trying hard since then? Yeah, I think it has, but I think that's all right. People have done a lot of different kinds of runs, slower but in more interesting cars, and I'm all for that. We had a great time reviving the US Express with Taylor Hull last fall, and I think that'll probably happen again at some point in the future. So I don't feel bad for the world of Cannonball. I think it's wonderful because the number of people that sit here telling stories about Cannonball are a whole lot more than 10, 15 years ago were even thinking about the idea. And so I think that's all great. But no, look, if you go out with an 800 wheel horsepower car, 100 spotters, central mission control, no countermeasures, only relying on the scouts to tell you what to worry about, yeah, I think it's possible to sustain a 120, 125 average in the right vehicle, especially since you could probably run it in a 911 Turbo or a GTC4 Lusso or one of these cars that is just a little bit more agile and a little bit more stable at high speed. It's terrifying to me for people to go out and try that because I do care a lot about maintaining the safety record that we've been able to so far in the 50 plus years of pursuing this ridiculous hobby. But I'm so glad to see the types of people that are trying, the ways that they're approaching it, and the results that they're having. There were lots of requests for what I think are the best investment cars that someone could buy today. There's a few that I think really do stand out. I think a TVR Cigaris, as it nears 25 years old, will certainly double in value because there are so many of us that grew up watching Swordfish and Tuscans and other cars where they were featured on Top Gear. I think that's amazing. I also think any car that was actually on a Top Gear production especially as they start to be 20 to 25 years old, that is going to be one of the best sources of provenance that any car could ever have. We've always seen occasionally premiums for press cars, pace cars, and things like that. And so I think the cars that we saw on Top Gear, I just ran into the XJ220 that Clarkson tested on Top Gear. I think those cars are going to go up in value. I also love, and I've said this many times, a Lotus Exige S260. They are proper rare, proper awesome, unrepeatable in a modern context, and so I think those two are just wonderful. I also think, obviously, that Mercy's Diablos and Spikers stand a wonderful chance of going up in the future. That's why I have voted with my checkbook and my credit on those cars, and so I think they're all headed in the right direction. That's not remotely 10, but I think those go up very, very nicely. Uh, there was a question of which of my Lamborghinis gets the most attention. Now, bright green is always the answer, and so the Verde Scandal Diablo SV right now gets the most attention. It just shipped off to get painted a new color, so we'll talk about that in future videos, but I love driving that car, and I think you add the color to the fact that it's such a 90s icon. It stands out a lot more in the crowd than some of the newer cars that have at least curvature that's more similar to the ways that they're constructing cars today. And so bright green is the answer. When I had the Verde Ithaca LP640, I had two people meaningfully crash while taking photos of it. And so it can be wildly uncomfortable, even relative to driving some of the other cars. But I, you know, the Draco car and the matte black car certainly kind of blend in enough that they don't grab you from a mile away. They shock you once you're right up on it. And so it's just a different response that I see from people on the road.
Ah, there's a question. Why don't I have an Aventador? Obviously, I love the idea of vertical car collections. I don't really fit and wouldn't want to use a Countach enough to own one. I like taking one out whenever I get the chance. And an Aventador fits there. I am just, as I've talked about, very allergic to depreciation. And so I'm not going to go out and buy a car that I know is going down in value. I have made some preposterously insulting offers on a lot of Aventadors lately because as we have Revuelto delivery starting in the next 30, 60 days, I think we're going to see the market just flooded with Aventadors. And so I love the cars. I have very fond memories of them, driving them when they were new, driving them at the press events and revealing them at Vallelunga and everything else that we did. I just uh, haven't had an itch so strong that I couldn't help but scratch it so far with an Aventador. How is Freddie doing with the P1? I gotta say, you know, there's there's two ways to look at the P1. One is the unbelievable hill it's going to be to climb to completion. And then there is the fact that it is undeniably the most successful project car in the history of the YouTube platform. Every video is getting a million, two million, three million views, up to five million on the reveal. That is phenomenal, and Freddie has done a great job with the content. He's currently on the hardest part of the build, and that is the electronics. Obviously, with a saltwater flood car, that's going to be the case. I think he gets there. I think it's going to work out, but man, it is a crazy, crazy project. I can't wait to see the vehicle completed. I can't wait to take it on some road trip with him as soon as he gets a legal title for it. But again, he's done a great job, continues to do a great job, and I think like all of you, I am enjoying the content. What would it take for me to sell every car in my collection? I think it would have to be a McLaren F1. Everything else I love, but not enough to get rid of everything, especially like the CL and at least one manual LP640. I could see a lot of circumstances where the other cars get rotated around over the next 10, 20 years. I would love to have the 1971 Daytona that Brock Yates and Dan Gurney won the first competitive cannonball in. I've tried to buy that many times and they always tell me no and please stop asking, but I won't stop asking because I want it so badly. But I mean, that would be pretty drastic. The, other, the only other circumstance I suppose would be if I somehow had such a windfall financially that I could buy really nice versions of all these cars, but I still think I would enjoy driving the rough ones as the way that I currently do. So no, I don't really see it happening unless somebody calls with a nice brown over red with gold wheel, McLaren F1 in terrible shape. The next one is a very specific question, but I actually really like it. It says, what is the best way to sell a low mileage Porsche that's been sitting for 13 years? And so, you know, that's a very open-ended question because I don't know what Porsche it is. If it's a really, really special car with really, really low miles, you probably leave it like that. We saw the RSR that's moved several times. It's never even been washed. And I think that can make sense because there is a collector out there that will put that car in somewhere just as it is. Now, if that isn't the case, if it's something that's just a great Porsche like a 928, 944, 911, any of these things, I think the best thing to do is keep whatever patina it has accumulated, service it all the way mechanically, and sell it as a great driving car to somebody who loved the cars when they were new, but now can't go buy a brand new one. But the fact that it's kind of a time capsule can be a huge asset in that type of an equation. Should we respect all builds? Along with a question about whether I want a sim. Certainly I do love sim racing. I don't think I have the time right now to spend a lot of time learning every track in a sim, but that is a great way to do it. But should we respect all builds? Absolutely. Now there's tons of things that are not to my taste, but what I've said many, many times is when we say that we love cars, all of us mean something a little bit different. And if modifying a car in a really unique way is the way that you love cars, the way somebody across cars and coffee loves cars, I am all for it. And they are probably going to be able to grow that version of their automotive passion into something amazing. And so I'm excited to see it all. I love looking at any car anybody cares that much about and talking to them about why they do and hopefully hearing a great story about it at some point. Before we move on to personal questions, I want to introduce our new sponsor for this month, Menta Watches. Now, if you're looking for some amazing watch content on YouTube, their YouTube channel is incredible. I'll put a link to it in the description below. Also, we've got a link to their website where it's a great marketplace and source for awesome vintage watches. I've got my eye on a few things that Adam and his team are rounding up. He'll be along at some point to tell some great watch car stories, but we appreciate their support of the YouTube channel. And if you're a watch guy like I am, that tends to go kind of hand in hand with the world of cars. Be sure to check them out on YouTube or on their website. Now, the personal questions are always a whole lot of fun. The first one is still a little bit automotive. It asks, how many tickets have I been given? 
Now, I've been given a lot more than I currently have showing. Thank you to the Ticket Clinic. They help me fight tickets no matter where I get them, and they have fought a lot of them for me. Now, I would say I've probably averaged a ticket a year of driving, so give or take 20 to 25 tickets in my driving so far. I think I've only had two or three that actually stayed on my record for any meaningful amount of time. It's never really impacted my insurance too heavily. I'm no Rob Ferretti sitting here talking about having hundreds and hundreds of tickets, although I really did love his logic that if there was just this immunity license where you could pay some astronomical annual price to never have to worry about getting tickets or having an insurance premium go up, most of us that love cars would pay thousands of dollars for this. And in his demeanor of just getting tickets, not worrying about it and paying lawyers to fight it, he's never spent that much in a calendar year. Makes an awful lot of sense, especially with connections like the Ticket Clinic. So I'll leave that to you guys, but I'll also put a link in the description of how you can reach the Ticket Clinic to fight your next one. Where did I learn to sell cars? I really learned by doing, but I did when I was just starting out at Lamborghini Atlanta, go to a Joe Verde car sales course. These are like hotel conference room classes that dealerships send their new employees to just to learn the mechanics of how to sell a car. And I really loved it. I, I feel like I absorbed a lot of it. I still hear car salesmen say Joe Verde catchphrases. And I think Anybody who wants to learn to sell anything should try to sell cars or at least learn how people sell cars because it's a wonderful and exciting way to kind of go through the mentalism of how you work someone through an interest in a car all the way to a buying decision. Uh, there was another question about how I learned like public speaking and things like that. I really learned that in college just by not being prepared for public speaking opportunities. And so if I was going to give a presentation, I tried to do as little prep work as possible so that it had to be organic. It had to be immediate off the cuff, just me thinking about what I'm presenting and doing the best that I can in that moment. And so it's allowed me to not need a script for everything I'm trying to talk through to just hopefully be able to think of the idea the end point, the middle, and the, everything I want to put in there and hopefully end up with something that is nice to listen to. Up next is, what is my favorite dinosaur? I gotta say a Dilophosaurus. I love dinosaurs growing up. I love the fact that you can go and get reptiles today that remind us of them. That was an amazing scene in Jurassic Park and just the frill and everything. I think it's perfect. What is my favorite hot dog condiment? Uh, thank you, Mark Spence, for that one. I would say pickle relish. I, I love a hot dog, cook a lot of them for the kids, and uh, certainly have enjoyed those. Uh, am I getting a new danger noodle? Now, I have not revealed that, but yes, there is a new boa constrictor in the Bolian household, and it has been a wonderful addition to the family. We did attempt a Cummings water monitor for a short time, and it was not a good fit, and there's a lot of scars to show for it, but um, he's now found a much better home. And uh, yeah, we love the new boa constrictor. His name is Leo. Uh, what is my favorite non-car hobby? That's a great question. I am in a season of life where most of my non-car hobbies are chasing children around. Uh, I've got two kids that are growing up very fast, and so most weekends we're out at sports games and play dates and all the fun stuff. And so really getting to know their families, spending time as a dad is my biggest hobby right now. I'd love to be able to play more basketball or do more outdoor stuff, but right now that is the focus. What percentage of your net worth should be in cars? Now, here comes a very hypocritical answer. Not 80%, but you know, most of my life that has been the case. Now, there is something to be said for sticking with what you're good at from an investment or a financial perspective. And most of my net worth has come from the appreciation and value in cars. But I suppose the real answer, even if you are a car professional, is more like 20% to a third. I've never been able to live by that idea. I don't really envision a world where I do unless the stock market really takes off sometime soon. I do believe in diversification and the time value of money and everything that can happen in a world where compound interest is applicable. And it's very important to understand that cars don't compound unless you transact in them. They do increase in value, but that will always be fairly linear. It's rarely exponential for any kind of long-term period. Whereas as your stocks and other investments that do have a percentage rate of annual return can achieve things like that. And so I think as we think of cars as investments and me and Tab and everybody else has always said, please don't look at them that way. There's a lot of ways that cars go up in value, but none of them have beaten the stock market for all that long. And so I, uh, I don't know, I'm not a very uh, good person to give advice on that because I've never lived by any of those rules. Where's Rabbit? 
Rob Pitts has not been on in quite some time. Right now, he is in El Paso shooting season two of Tex-Mex Motors for Netflix. I hope you checked out season one. It's so much fun for me to see these guys going on to do such great things and how, you know, hopefully being here has been a part of the springboard to that success. And so Rob is doing great things. I'm sure he'll be back soon. And that might be where my Diablo is at the moment. We'll find out. If I wasn't doing this, what would a normal Ed be doing? You know, I think about that a lot because I never expected to be doing this. I do miss the transactional nature of selling cars. I think I could love going back and managing or, you know, at least sales managing a car dealership. I still don't know that I could tolerate the hours and the day-to-day -day existence of being in a dealership environment, but I do miss the chance to do deals, make deals, buy cars, sell cars more often than I get to just as a private individual. And so, I don't know, maybe one day, I also think I'd really enjoy teaching high school. In a previous AMA, I mentioned that I attribute all of my success to a single decision that I made many, many years ago, and I didn't say what that was. And I, that's a story that I'll tell another day, but I will say it was the decision to stay married when there were a lot of reasons not to. And I just, uh, that has really transformed my life, both the decision and the reasons why. And so it's been a great part of my life today, and I point it all back to that. The next question is kind of in the same vein. What are some good marriage tips for entrepreneurs or car enthusiasts? I think it's both very, very similar. It's hard at times to get our significant others to understand why and how we love things that we certainly enjoy, but also you know, get frustrated with and, and have a lot of challenges with. And I think that's where I dealt with this a lot in sales with owners that wanted to buy more cars but had some pushback from their wives. And I said, look, it's all about making the experience net positive for everyone. Sometimes that's financial, but the one that you have the most control of is how much you enjoy the car. And if there's a lot of anxiety, concern, fear, challenges, and things all like that, that really interfere with the fundamental enjoyment of whatever it is, whether it's a business or a car, that's gonna make it easy for your significant other, your wife to say, I don't know why this makes so much sense. Why don't you do this that to them seems like an option that would involve less friction and less discomfort. And so it's all in how you frame it towards them. Now we want to be vulnerable. We want them to understand what we're feeling, what we're concerned about, but it all needs to come full circle. All stories need happy endings. And so just make sure that there's always something of a happy ending when you talk to them about the things that you love. Now, several of you asked about my testimony, and uh, I've made it very clear. I'm a Christian. I love God. I love Jesus and the sacrifice that we've celebrated this weekend over Easter. That being said, my I haven't told my whole testimony. I, honestly, I grew up in a family that taught me about God, that taught me that God loved me, that had me in some great churches growing up. And so I think that's the greatest privilege that I'll ever enjoy from my parents and uh, my, my generations of family that have amazing backgrounds in faith. But much more significantly, as I went out in the world to college and living on my own, I was able to encounter people of different faiths, of different backgrounds, and had different mentors that were both secular and Christian. And I think I learned so much through that process of understanding what God meant to me and what their beliefs meant to them to sharpen how I understood God, how I understood God's relationship with man, and how I was able to sort of ma mature in my faith, which I think is a constant process for all of us. And so I, I love the church that I'm in right now here in Alpharetta, Georgia. It's been an amazing experience. And so I, I, I'd say that my testimony is, is ongoing. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of things there. The next question, though, was what is my favorite verse from the Bible? And my favorite book is Daniel, and my favorite verse is from Daniel 3, where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are about to be thrown into the furnace by Nebuchadnezzar, and he asks them, you know, why won't you just bow down? Can your God save you from this furnace? And they said, clearly, our God can do anything. He's amazing, and he will if he chooses to, but even if he doesn't. And I think those words are the most powerful words in the entire Bible. They said they won't bow down. But even if God doesn't deliver me from whatever is painful, whatever is difficult, whatever is challenging on earth, that won't interfere with my faith and my confidence in who he is and what he's done for me with respect to eternity. And so that's the way I try to live my life. I hope for great outcomes. I even pray for great outcomes in work and in family and life. But at the end of the day, God has solved the biggest thing, which is my sin, my failures that separated me from him and offered a path to reconciliation through Jesus. 
The next one's fun too. What is my favorite car to drive to church? <laughs> I have to say that I have driven everything to church and I love it all. I love driving Lamborghinis to church and letting the kids sit in them and let them learn that you don't have to be some famous rapper to have fun things and you can just have either mountains of debt or old enough cars that they're no longer depreciating. So trying to show that there are, I don't know if it, responsible is the right word, but there are all other ways to have fun things. What is the best supercar for tall people? I'm about six foot five. I've got about a 35 inch inseam and a size 14 shoe? That was another question that was asked. And so I have tried to squeeze myself into just about every kind of exotic car. And like Jeremy Clarkson once said, who's only a couple inches shorter than I am, he said, I can fit into everything that I want to. And whether it's a low body Countach or anything else, I can generally get into any car well enough to make it move. If I was a couple inches taller, that would probably be in question. But I've been able to do it. The most comfortable cars for really tall people are the 2 plus 2 Ferraris, 612 FF, Lusso, also the uh, Bentleys of generally all variety. I loved that Super Sports we had for Car Trek 8. And so those are always going to be your good options. Even the ones that are convertibles though, a lot of times you have some head clearance issues with whatever the margins are, roll bars and things like that. So those are my picks. But just squeeze yourself into whatever you like. This was a good one. What is the most unethical thing that I've ever done in a car transaction? You know, the, the negotiation process can be at least unethical feeling because people are asking, well, what's the best price that you can do? Well, there's plenty of deals where we lose money on cars, but my job is to maintain gross, not just because it's the right thing to do for the person I work for, but also because the more that a customer pays, the more they will like a car. I don't have time to explain exactly why that is, but that is true in all sales. If they're not buying just because of the price, they are buying because they love it, which means they will ultimately love it more. I guess the most unethical thing I ever did would be selling a car when we'd already crashed the guy's trade. I told that story here on the channel, and I was told to do that by my boss. Um, but it was also, and I do believe this, and we could talk more about it at any point, in the best interest of that buyer because the complication mentally of his readiness to buy the car that he had already expressed that he wanted and agreed that he wanted to figure out a way to buy it, even if he wasn't ready to make the decision as immediately, the end result was better for him and he did get a wonderful deal. He probably had more leverage from us on the trade value and I suppose that would make it unethical. But man, it was a challenge that I was very excited to try and I was glad it worked out and he loved that Nissan GTR. What is your best advice for a young enthusiast getting into car buying? Build your credit up and avoid depreciation. If you don't have to have the latest brand new car, and if you build it up through a great credit profile, you will have the buying power as you come across cars that you know better, that have a bigger margin, to make money along the way and flip your way into a whole lot of equity. I think I am up about 5x on my dollars invested in car buying relative to the current value of my cars. And so that's a pretty amazing place to be. But without those two ideas, none of it would have worked. What is your favorite whiskey? I like Old Forester 1920 and Eagle Rare. I like a lot of whiskeys and bourbons and I continue to experiment with new ones, but those two are always my go-to. What is the best radar detector and laser system? Redenzo, which we've used a lot on Gold Rush and other events, is an amazing system, especially as it works with the AL Priority Jammers. I also really like the new Escort and the new Udenin products. I've always been a Valentine One guy, but I think the margin is at least close enough that the others are compelling cases. What advice would I give to my 16-year-old self? I, I kind of answered a version of this question in one of the other AMAs, but my honest answer is I wouldn't give him any advice. I would just tell him to do everything you plan to do because everything that I've done that resulted in a lot of pain, a lot of difficulty, a lot of discomfort, I can now point to what I learned from those things and say that I wouldn't have made future decisions were it not for those things. So of all the rentals I would have said to avoid, of all the cars I would have said to buy or not buy, man, other than buying a McLaren F1 with credit you never had and money you didn't have, I don't know, man. I mean, I just, I love the cars that I have. I love the decisions that, I, that I've made because of the outcomes that they eventually led to even when it wasn't the immediate result. This is a great one. What are my favorite stories that have been told over the years? I think my favorite story is Bill Warner's story of finding and restoring and eventually selling at a massive profit the Edsel Ford Speedster. It was a car that really he was the only one looking for. He had the vision of exactly what to do with it and he achieved that outcome. I saw the amazing blessing that that was to his and his family's life and just an awesome car with an awesome story that ended up in a great place. 
I also love these AMG hammer stories that we've had over the last 18 to 24 months as those cars have exploded in value because they are the only situations where I've ever seen people have 100x profits in cars inside of a decade. That is nuts. That is unheard of. I don't think that growth rate could possibly sustain. Obviously it can't, but it's amazing that some of these guys had the foresight to understand these cars are going somewhere and they have them tucked away in their garages and some of them are actually driving them. They're not the most reliable of things though. I also loved Tommy Davies' story from last year of defending himself in the high courts of Britain for something that he had already done interviews on about on the radio. An amazing story. If you haven't watched it, please check it out. Up next, we're on to business questions, but before I do that, I just want to say another thank you to last month's sponsor, Auto Tempest. Auto Tempest has supported us over the years. It is the best place to shop for your next car. We've talked a lot about car buying, a lot about car shopping and car preferences, but honestly, it is where I go most mornings to start my day looking for the next crazy automotive decision. So please check them out at the link in the description below. Helping them helps us grow to hopefully even more than 2 million subscribers. But some business questions were really great. What has changed over the years in terms of video style and performance? Now, our VinWiki car stories honestly haven't changed all that much. We're still doing, you know, eight to 15 minute car stories sitting in this chair with this same background in this same spot. And that has worked out remarkably well. And I, I think it was just a shot in the dark that it might be right in the first place. I still generally sit the same way, even though I just crossed my legs in the opposite direction because this has been a little longer than our normal video. But I think short form content, more subtitles, more square cropping, vertical, all this stuff is changing rapidly. And I think for a small business or a content creator that's just looking for the best ways to brand themselves, there are so many more options, both in platform and content style today. Whenever I see a new piece of content that I just think, man, that is a genius way to approach the audience, to approach the platform, I still get super duper excited. I want to do more appraisals. I want to do more car trek, more high quality long form stuff, because clearly that's a big direction. And I think that for businesses in particular, focusing on finding the right organic integration and collaboration with a content creator is always the recipe for marketing success. How has media success changed VinWiki's business strategy? It has changed it entirely. The app obviously came before the YouTube channel by about a year, but today 95 or more percent of my time is spent on our content strategy and that is what pays the bills. The app still doesn't make money, even though we've now got more than 500,000 registered users and more than 160 million cars in the database, 10 million user posts, and more than 10 billion connections amongst cars. But it's, you know, it's one of those things where today it makes sense for me to continue focusing on the media side for reasons about the app that we'll talk about in a few questions from now. Why is there no giveaway at 2 million subscribers? Well, the simple answer is when we try that stuff with cheap cars or giveaways or car flipping contests or anything like that, the words that we use seem to cause the videos to get rather suppressed and the view counts are never all that good. So it ends up being net negative, which I hate because I'd love to do more like that, but I just have not been able to. And so hopefully there'll be more in the future, but that's why there's not one right now. Many, many versions of the question of what is going on with the VinWiki app. And I appreciate so much that you care enough about the app for that to happen. The VinWiki app was built in a six month period by several friends of mine in 2016. And to be quite honest, it really exists today in about the same version that it did back then. That's for a couple of reasons. The first is it didn't immediately take off to an extent that we could afford to pay a full team of software developers to take it to that 2.0 level. And the guys that had built it, it kind of built to the extent of their existing technical abilities. And so they weren't in a position to make it a whole lot better. Today, we're not in a wildly different situation where the media brand pays for my salary and the salary of a couple of editors, but not for an entire team of software developers. And if we go out trying to raise money like a normal tech startup does, the fact that we have this big media mouthpiece actually has interfered with that a lot. And so I don't know where to find the 500,000 to a million dollars that it will take to make the next development in the VinWiki app. We're looking at several options. I'm talking to various people and I believe we're going to find a great way. Right now we are having an issue in the Android store because there was a new privacy permission thing that you had to be able to add and our existing code could not accept it. So I'm told we're a couple of weeks away from having a new version that will be live in the app store on Android. But in the meantime, you can always use it at web.venwiki.com. 
Now, I loved the questions. What about a VinWiki Live concept? Is it an event, a rally, a show, things like that? So thank you so much for the interest in that. We have talked a lot about, you know, like a meet and greet or a group storytelling event or a cruise or things like that. And so I think we're going to find some ways to do that in the coming years. I don't know exactly what they're going to look like or what kind of partners we're going to need in order to make it possible, but I do love the idea and I want to find a way to make it happen. Where is Kimmy? Well, Kimmy is still incarcerated, but she is supposed to be getting out soon. We have been in communication with her. She's very excited to sit here and tell some stories as we are to hear them. So there is content planned. There are things we are working on, but unfortunately she is still indisposed. <laughs> Will I start an auction site? Vins and bids. That does have a nice ring to it. I don't think an auction site is the next answer. I do have some ideas for some marketplace concepts that could become components of the VinWiki app. And so I think we could move in that direction at some point in the future. I do not know exactly what that will be. But uh, yeah, I mean, we've certainly talked about it. I get approached by people, the same kinds of investors that Doug took on. But that hasn't been the most successful transition from just the pure vision that Doug had for cars and bids and the results they've had, let's say, in the last 12 months. And so I don't know what the answer is. It won't be VinWiki auctions, but you never know. It might be something. Will I ever sell VinWiki? I don't think any entrepreneur thinks like this is exactly what I'm going to be doing forever. I think we all have fairly short attention spans. I am enjoying this opportunity more than I ever imagined and more than I've enjoyed any other thing that I have done professionally in the world of cards or anything else. And so I'm having a blast. I am not looking to sell anytime soon. I am always open to partnerships, mergers, things like that. I've dealt with a lot of offers that we've gotten to buy VinWiki over the years and haven't really gotten near a finish line there for you know a variety of, I think, valid reasons. But I, uh, I think probably at some point that may happen. It won't ever involve me like just washing my hands of it and going away. I think I'll always be involved and I think whether it's in a, a marketing or branding or whatever perspective, I'm, I'm always happy to not run the whole show. That's never been my point of pride or my requirement. So there's a lot of ways that could happen. They haven't happened yet, but uh, hey, you never know. <laughs> there were some questions about videos that we have removed. Now we have taken down videos because the Hells Angels asked, because Top Gear asked, because the Grand Tour asked, because the Indianapolis Police Department asked, and because a variety of other people asked. And in those situations, we take it down either because we find something that is incorrect about the video that we've released, or because the expense to someone else is far greater than the benefit that it could have to us or the storyteller. And so I'm not here to ruin anybody's life. I'm not here to defame or anything like that. And so there are certainly times where it doesn't make sense for a video to stay up. And we try to be honest, realistic about all that. And so there are times when we take them down. But um, in those situations, yeah, each of them is a much longer story. And I don't know if there will ever be a great chance to tell them in their details. Do we pay the storytellers? That's a great question. Uh, no, we do not. Uh, like most podcasts and things like that, we can't pay the guests. I never know how much a video is going to make. I do happily reimburse for expenses and travel and things like that, and I'll put them up in local hotels as needed, but I don't pay them. I am inundated every single day, every single hour with people that beg me to come here and tell stories, and I just don't generally have the capacity to record all of them. And so I, what I love seeing is how much it has benefited so many of them. So many of them had their own channels grow, their own brands grow, their own opportunities grow, get shows on cable or streaming or whatever else. And so it can be a great thing. But the thing that I care about most is that the storytellers are always very proud of the final result that we achieve in the videos. I don't want it to be about VinWiki. I don't want it to be just about the sponsors. I want it to be about the storytellers and I want the end product to be something that they want to share, that they want to look back on years, decades from now, so that people even beyond their sphere of influence, their friends, their grandkids, get to hear their amazing car stories. That's the mission here. The next one is, when did I realize that VinWiki could be a real job? So we started in June of 2017, and I think it was probably sometime around like December of 2017. I remember being home with my parents around the holidays, and I had just made $100 in a single day, which was my wife's teacher salary. And I was like, look, I have a job. And at that point, it had been almost two years to the day since I left the dealership. And so I went two years without making a dollar. The only money I made was the profit from selling the roof, which was not 
nothing, but I had not really earned by working a dollar up until that point. And I kind of saw the light at the end of a very, very long tunnel at that point that like this could turn into a job. Now, a year or so prior to that, I had spoken to Doug DeMuro about just the opportunity on YouTube. And he had mentioned at point one point that he was going to make almost $10,000 in a month on YouTube. And I don't think he'll mind me saying that as I think it's gotten a little better than that since then. But it was one of those Wolf of Wall Street moments where I'm like, you show me a pay stub for $10,000 a month. That is crazy. You were a writer for Jalopnik at the time. And he was. But I, uh, I've, I've been amazed at the opportunity and the, uh, it's, it's never the same. It's not consistent. It's any kind of entrepreneurship, but I am uh, blessed, honored, and privileged to have the chance to earn a living telling stories and letting other people tell stories on the channel. What is the hardest place to import a car from? This probably would have been more of a car question, but the answer is China. It is illegal to export cars from China. It's also illegal to import used cars to China. And so if you try to get one out, it is really, really problematic. We might be trying right now. Now the final question, even though there's many, many more, and if you have more questions, just ask me in the comments. I'll do my best to answer them over the next few days. But the next one was, what is the best advice that I have for a young business owner that wants to start flipping cars? Where do they search? Well, the answer is obviously Auto Tempest, but the answer is truly Auto Tempest. You want to cast the widest net possible, and Auto Tempest allows you to do that better than any other site. They're going to allow you to search Facebook Marketplace nationally, which is a huge thing. Craigslist nationally, eBay and all the other sites at the same time. So that's why I use it and that's why it works so well. Now the hope is also that eventually it comes full circle and the cars start to find you. Because when you're able to get yourself out there and let the world know that you want to buy the worst examples of the coolest cars ever built, they tend to start being sent to your inbox. And so I hope that happens for you. It happens as you specialize. Nobody goes out there and is successful at flipping every different kind of car over and over again. And so I wish you all the best in that journey of trying to look like you won the lottery 10 or 15 years ago. It's worked well for me, and I know there are great results to come. But these results of passing 2 million subscribers have been a surprise, a blessing, and a huge honor for me and all the other storytellers here at VinWiki. Thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. Please continue to do so. We will keep the content coming.